thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love never ends. You may be seated. If you are a farmer, can you look outdoors and say, yeah, God is good. <laughs> but you know what? He's not only good through what he gives us, but he comes to us and loves us. You know, if God is so powerful that he could create the world, don't you think he could get tired of us and just get rid of us? But he keeps on loving us. Well, it's great to see you. By the way, if you, if you haven't been here for a while, this marks a kind of an eight-month tradition. Because for the last eight months, every time I preach, we get precipitation. <laughs> and it was one month ago that John Rushke said, are you preaching, are you scheduled to preach the second Sunday in July? I said, yes, I am. He said, great. We will need a good rain about that. <laughs> so you can think what you want to, just don't make any predictions. By the way, we have this red vinyl folder in your book rack. Be sure that you take it, register your presence, pass it back down the center aisle. And uh, if you are worshiping with us for the first time, would you stop at the visitor center because we, the welcome center, because we have a gift that we'd like to give you just to show how honored we were that you would come and worship with us today. I want to thank uh, Me uh, Melanie Reiners and Wade Falk for assisting me in the service, plus our praise team. We'll take them for granted, but so glad that we're together. Now, uh, you know in our, inside the bulletin you have some assists in worshiping. You can read that. And then further down we have a paragraph of names. That's our ministry of caring. And um, we, we care about all of them, and they're all important. We want to keep praying through the week, but we really especially need to be remembering the Barnhards. This is very critical for them. And then you have in your bulletin that inserts black on white. That's the announcements. You see the uh, central raise uh, deadline. Uh, Meals on Wheels, these volunteers, Central Core Corps, and all that. Just read every part, take this home with you, make sure that you can stay in touch with what we have together. Okay, let's stand up one more time and greet the people around us. so good to be here and it's so good that you're all here. Yeah. Let's, let's worship together. I'd like to start this time with a word of prayer. Dear Father God, we come humbly today as the glad receivers of your mercy and your grace. There is absolutely nobody like you, nobody close, and our desire is to worship you in spirit and truth as King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you and we praise you for who you are and what you've done. We acknowledge your presence in this place and in us as believers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thank you for your never-ending, never-failing grace. Remember that all of the good things we enjoy are not only the result of our work, but that you, you have had your mighty hand in our well-being, our comfort, and our success. We pray, Lord, that we don't get so caught up in living when things are going well that we forget to be thankful. Lord, we are grateful. Forgive us for being so forgetful. Beyond our community, remember those who are suffering from war and political unrest. We pray for a peaceful transition in government in Egypt and for stability in the countries where our troops are serving, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, and others. Our thoughts are with those in mission throughout the world. We especially remember our United Methodists in mission in Haiti, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, and Nigeria. Uphold them as they bring the gospel to those who have never heard of your saving grace. And we pray this morning for that new ministry that is being started in the Bakken oil field of North Dakota. Make this outreach a meaningful, enriching experience for the families who struggle with loneliness, crowded living conditions, and lack of uplifting social interaction. May they feel your comfort. We thank you today for the lives of Scott Storm, Marcy DeVore, Wilbur Lexi, and Gladys Bonnie Van Beek's mom. Give their families an extra measure of your grace as they mourn the loss of these loved ones. May their knowledge of you, their Savior, give comfort and peace this day. We pray for your comfort for those who are recovering from surgery and those who are suffering from illness today. We remember Kathy Barnhart, Joan Bone, Martha Shakey, Ione Bramer, Richard Bone, Jeff Schultz, Ron Lundberg, and Eric Meisner as all of those whose names are not known to us, uh, to us all, but we're going to bring them silently in our hearts before you this morning. Touch them and heal them. Help them to feel your love and care as they heal from surgery or seek treatment for their various illnesses. In our thoughts today are Tom and Jessica Graham as they seek legal resolution regarding their daughter Elise. Give them your comfort and strength and patience as they wait. And we join together now in the prayer that our Savior first gave to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I, I want to invite our boys and girls to come and join me up here this morning. And uh, will you help me sing? This, this is where children belong. Welcome, that's part of the worshiping throng. Water, God's word, bread, and copper, and song. This is where children belong. Well, good morning. The, oh, your sister someplace else, huh? You know what? Your moms and dads sure made good-looking kids. Do you know that? Hey, I brought some things that <clears throat> you can tell me what it is. I know you can't, but I want to use it as our children's sermon. You know what this is, don't you? It's bread. And what do we do with bread? Eat it, right? Do we eat it? Do you eat bread just to get rid of it? Why do you eat bread? It tastes good and uh, gives you energy. Gives you get up and go. All right. And you know this here. What's that? 
That's a flashlight. What do we use flashlights for? To see in the dark. So that you can tell where you're going or you can find what you're looking for. Now, in the Bible, it says that Jesus, it calls him the bread of life. And it calls him what else? The light of the world. Doesn't mean that Jesus had a flashlight. Didn't mean that he carried a slice of bread. But it, it's like a picture, you see? Boys and girls, this is not just bread, but I mean, I mean, this is bread, but when the Bible talks about bread, it's talking about food. And you need food to grow, don't you? Your mother and dad make you eat the right kind of food. You'd rather eat desserts all the time, nice bowls, and they make you eat some vegetables, and things like that. And that's because food is good for helping you to grow. And then, you know, it's so good to have these lights or it's good to have a flashlight, but we don't see the sun out there today, but the sun is what makes things grow, right? We couldn't, we couldn't have bread, we couldn't have trees or grass or anything without sunlight. Now, when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, he is saying that God made us to walk with Jesus so that Jesus can guide us, help us, show us the way, give us faith. And boys and girls, you just can't really live without Jesus. And so while you're young, some of you are a little older than others, but you hear about Jesus when your parents read you your Bible stories, or when you come to church and to Sunday school. But when you get older, listen, listen to what Jesus says, and take him into your life and walk with him. Because as bread makes you strong, as light helps you to see the way, walking with Jesus will show you the way to live your life, that you will be glad you did. May I pray for you? Lord, I thank you for these boys and girls. I thank you that you have given them life and that they're here in the church and we can tell them about Jesus. And we just pray that the Holy Spirit would just give them such an interest in Jesus that as they're growing up, they will listen to the stories. They will fall in love with Jesus and they will walk with Jesus not only as boys and girls, but some days as adults. Amen. Hey, good to see you. You can go back to your parents now. First John 1. 1 through 10. That which was, was from the beginning, which he had heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, we have, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship 
with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We confess our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Reading of God's word. If somebody came to you and asked you, are you a Christian? How would you answer them? Yes. Assuming that you would answer them yes. And if they followed that up with the questions are, well, how do you know that you are a Christian? Or why do you choose to be a Christian? How do you think that you would follow up with those answers, with answers to those questions? Some of us who do not enjoy confrontational discussions tend to steer clear of uh, discussions around subjects that deal with religion or politics. As a matter of fact, we think that those are private subjects and should be left to the individual. But the Bible presents us with a few challenges regarding a private Christian faith. The Apostle Paul wrote, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess that you are saved. Jesus, in giving to us the Great Commission, said, Go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. And his last final instructions to his disciples and to you and me as his church were, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses. People, there is definitely a sense of responsibility for us who call ourselves to be Christians and followers of Jesus Christ. But the thought of practicing a public type of evangelism is terrifying to some of us. So think practically with me, if you will. Should not the practice of being a witness to our faith in Jesus Christ rely more heavily upon our desire to witness than upon the commandment to witness? And does it not seem more logical that the more knowledge we have about our Christian faith, the more comfortable we will be to enter into dialogue regarding our faith. See, I believe that a major contributor to our hesitancy to share our Christian faith is our inability to understand and to define it. The gospel. The gospel is the good news. The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news regarding our salvation through Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news about the kingdom of God that Christ has revealed and shown to us. And if we are a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, then we are commanded to share the good news. And if the gospel is good news to us, then there ought to be a desire inside. I want to, to somehow share that with other people. A lady met me in a local business place one day and asked if she could talk to me about my back surgery. And I invited her to come and do so. You see, back surgery has been such a blessing to me that anybody who wants to talk to me, I'm more than willing to tell them about what it did for me, what it has meant to me. Because to me, 
That is a simple courtesy. So I raise the question again. Do we consider ourselves to be a Christian? If so, why do we want to be a Christian? And why would we want to share what we have found with somebody else? All religions have some kind of a motivational uh, power or force because that's how they promote their religion. And for Christians, it is known as evangelism. But again, for too many of us, the idea of doing evangelism is at least embarrassing, if not terrifying. You might be, we might be interested in promoting our church if somebody is looking for a church. But to in any way make any kind of a suggestion that we might have something that somebody else might not have, well, that just doesn't seem right. The science of demographics is the science of studying populations and population shifts. And through the study of demographics, we learned that a century ago, 90% of the Christian church was located in that geographical area that we call the Western world, you know, Europe and North America and that. Today, 68% of the Christian church resides outside of the Western world. In Africa today, every day from 22 to 24,000 people a day become believers in Jesus Christ. And in China, communistic China, Every day, the church adds about 1,600 new believers to their fellowship. The builder generation, which fought World War II, they testified that about 60% of that generation considered themselves to be Christians. The baby boomer generation, which followed them, that dropped from 66% to 35 percent. That was followed by the Generation X, and that dropped the percentage of our population that considers themselves to be Christians to 22 percent. And the millennial generation, that is the younger generation of today, that figure has dropped from 12 to 15 percent who consider themselves to be Christian. And the younger somebody is in our world today, especially in the United States, the less likely they are to hear the gospel or to even know that there is a gospel, even in America and increasingly, especially in America. Now, most of us would be classified as white Anglo persons of a European descent. And our offspring would be white Anglo youth of our present generation. And especially, especially among the white Anglo youth of America today, there is a developing a distrust of authority of institutions and all hierarchical forms. And this includes a deep distrust for the government and for the church, even the church clergy. And so I ask, where will these people hear the truth presented in the gospel? John Stott assures us that while people today among the younger generation are skeptical about the church, they are not closed to Jesus. John the Apostle was witnessing to his Christian faith in the writing of that first epistle that this, the text was read from this morning. And John's witness to his Christian faith is both without hesitation or without apology. 
Now listen to how he ends his introduction. He said, our motive for writing is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. Your joy will double our joy. John makes generous use of the pronoun we. John's enthusiasm over what he knows and he believes, over his confidence in what he knows and believes, over his strong desire to share it with others, is also shared by the community of faith around him. So he says, we. And this raises our confidences in what John wrote because his words are not just his sole interpretation of the gospel, but it's supported by all of those around him who are part of the church. <coughs> now what the apostle John wrote to his fellow believers <coughs> was confirmed and verified by the church. Therefore, John's audience then and John's audience now will want to pay close attention to what John said that they believed. See, their faith, that faith that John was speaking about was firmly rooted in Jesus Christ and their faith in Jesus Christ. Who he was why he had come into their world. And this is important to us because you and I will not have a sound Christian faith and we will not have a desire to share our faith until we have a reasonably clear understanding for ourselves as to who Jesus Christ is and why he has come into our world. Now John identifies this Jesus as he who was in the beginning with all time and all things. He who is the word of life. He who reveals the meaning of life. He who brings eternal life from the heavenly Father to us. And particularly notice John's purpose in writing which was he wasn't writing just to show how much he knew. But his reason for writing is this. He said, this we proclaim to you. That which he had been made aware of, he testified to, he bore witness to. Now how could recipients of John's faith have such faith in his writing? How could they just be confident that John knew what he was talking about? Well, John explained that he and his fellow churchmen, they themselves had seen Jesus. They themselves had heard Jesus. They themselves had touched Jesus. They themselves knew Jesus. What was the motivational force that was driving John and his fellow churchmen to so strongly desire that others become participants with them in this faith that they had? It was because in Jesus Christ they had found fellowship with God the Father. And that fellowship had fulfilled a deep human desire to know joy. And John was saying, I'm not just telling you about my joy, but if you will come to believe what I'm telling you about, then joy will be complete for both of us. And the way to discover this joy was through their knowing Jesus Christ as John and his fellow churchmen had come to know Jesus Christ. And my friends, it those early believers really knew what they were writing about. We want to really pay attention, won't we? Because we will want to discover what they had discovered, that the claims of Jesus Christ are for real. And what were the claims of Jesus? He claimed that he is the light of the world, that he is the bread of life, that he is the way and the truth and the life. 
I don't know about you, but I can't even imagine what the world would be like without light. Or without bread or basic food. <coughs> or with truth to guide us. We couldn't exist without them, could we? And we and those for whom we share space on this planet Earth cannot know what it really means to live without a living encounter with the God who made us and with the Christ who introduced us to this God because every person who lives on this planet is as much a spiritual being as they are a physical being. And to know life, they must have a relationship with the God who made them just much as we need to have air and water and food to live. But without an exposure to the gospel, how will today's non-believers ever come to know this truth about themselves and about the God who loves them and cares about us? I quote Dr. Timothy Tennant. We have to penetrate the world of teachers, lawyers, doctors, and laborers so to equip the laity to see themselves as being called by God to see their work as holy work. Meaning that wherever we work as laity, our work is not just to simply satisfy a career, but our work to be, is to be a vocation, a calling from God, to be a truth teller wherever the opportunity comes through and where we do our work. I made an unexpected encounter with that young man. And when he learned that I was a minister, he somewhat apologetically confessed that he had forsaken the church that he had been raised in. And he had discarded everything he had been raised about religion. That actually, he said, I'm an agnostic. Well, I shared my strong belief in God. I just, I just said, well, you know, I have a very strong belief in God. And, and I know that there's one thing that God and I have in common. We both like agnostics. And that just opened the door for us to have a warm and open discussion. And at the end of the discussion, I presented an open-ended challenge to him. I said, you know, if you are really an agnostic, then you are not saying you just don't believe. You are saying that at this time, you don't have the evidence to believe. But you're not opposed to truth if truth can be given to you and you can be convinced of it. And he said, you got it right. I said, okay, can I just give you an invitation then to come to church and just sit and listen and watch and see what happens. Fast forward with me 18 years about. Joan and I are back in that city. We are having a meal in a local restaurant and suddenly I'm aware that somebody is standing next to our table and look, and there is that gentleman and his wife. And we share a brief conversation and he says, before you go, will you come to our table so that I can introduce you to my children? And we complied. And this is how he introduced me to his children. He said, this man is the reason as to why we are a Christian family. Why we believe in God. Why we believe in the Bible and try to live by it. Why we go to church. Because this man helped me to discover that Jesus Christ and God are real and can be known. And how did that take place? When the Holy Spirit used a conversational encounter where two men showed enough respect for each other 
that they could have a civil discussion about the subject of truth, even though they were on opposite sides. Jason Humpton is the chairperson of the Committee on Evangelism in this church, and I am the staff representative to that committee. And in our search for ways to assist our church to fulfill our purpose of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jason and I, on behalf of the committee, wish to make a proposal. And that is, if we are a Christian, we have been called by God to share the good news of the gospel. And our proposal is built upon the assumption that the best way to be motivated to share the gospel is to be first sold on the gospel ourselves, so that we've got something we would like somebody else to have. And that want to begins with our own fellowship with God, with our own understanding of why we are a Christian, and our own understanding of why we believe and what we believe as a Christian, and by our own respect for somebody else might, might think differently. So we are considering inviting people that might be interested to join us to form a class where together with interested persons, we could discuss and search how to fulfill what the Apostle Peter instructs us to do when he wrote, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this in gentleness and with respect. We have, we, we would like, if anybody's interested in even just conversing about it, to come and talk with us. Let us see if there's, if we've got an idea that might serve some purposes. Or maybe you've got some suggestions about better material, but what, uh, what we would suggest as beginning material would be something like John Stott's book, Why I Am a Christian. Uh, and then a book like Paul Little, who's an apologist on Know Why You Believe, or in place of this, it could be another book by Stott, Basic Christianity. And we just come together and we work through some of these things and just kind of better understand what it is. What it is to be a Christian? Why, why, why are we interested in this? How could we explain it to somebody else? And also, how, how can we really feel comfortable being around people who don't believe like us and don't have to become defensive or anything? And you see, what we do is we rely, rely upon the Holy Spirit to open the door for us to just dialogue. But I believe the better prepared we are to carry on a dialogue, the more likely the Holy Spirit will open the door. So, we want, we want to help ourselves and anybody else with us to learn how to investigate the credentials of being a Christian and a follower of Christ. And we would invite you just to come and discuss this with us and see whether you and I together would have an interest in investigating it further. Amen. Let us worship together by bringing our tithes and our offerings.
Thomas are able to say, my Lord. 